their friends, and these are my friends, NFL insider Adam Schefter and NFL front office insider Louis Riddick. Uh, boys, no phones at my table, just so you know. <laughs> I don't know if that'll apply with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Adam, try, try not to. It's all good. Uh, Adam, I want to start with you. You covered Kubiak uh, most of his career. He spent 22 years uh, in the Broncos organization. What sort of legacy or how will he be remembered in Denver? They've won Super Bowls in Denver. They've never won a Super Bowl when Gary Kubiak has not been a part of that organization. He was a backup quarterback there and John Elway's roommate at a time when they were going to Super Bowls in the late 80s and early 90s. He was the offensive coordinator when they won their first two Super Bowls. He came back and led them back to the Super Bowl as the head coach. He is a man of an honor, integrity. He's done a great job there. He will be missed there. And he has meant an awful lot. The fact that all these players were there in attendance, that he means as much to them as he does, tells you how they feel about him, how the organization feels about him, how the city feels about him. I've known him for 27 years. He's a great man, and I am sad and happy yeah. to see him walk away in this fashion today. Louis, he's walking away at 55 years old because of health issues, and mm -hmm. we've seen that a lot this season. We've seen a lot in the last few seasons. How do coaches prepare for, for what it takes? You've been in front offices before. How do they handle all the stress? Well, actually, to be quite honest, they could probably do a little bit better at it because what happens is you get put in, you, you wind up secluding yourself so much in the, into the preparation and working 18, 19, 20-hour days, maybe sleeping four hours a day, and you wind up not, by the end of the day, finding enough time to really take care of yourself both mentally and physically. So I, I would actually say that Gary is probably bringing some much-needed attention to the fact that coaches need to be much more cognizant of taking care of themselves health-wise. I know Adam Gase has talked about the fact that it's one of the things that he's trying to implement down in Miami as far as having coaches really required to work out during the day, required to take some time away from their desks, away from the film rooms, away from the meeting rooms, away from install rooms, because these guys are grinding now from August all the way to January in some cases, maybe February. And, look, when I first got into personnel back in 2001, I worked for John Schneider in Washington. And one of the first things he told me was, I guarantee you, you'll lose that athletic figure of yours a little bit because you're going to wind up putting on some yeah. weight because of the time that you put in. And he, I wound up gaining 20-plus pounds. Mm -hmm. 20, and over the 20 next, more to ESPN. No, not, yeah. no. Well, I had, I had to take it back off, quite that. honestly. But, uh, yeah, I, they don't do a good enough job, and I think guys are now starting to see that it's probably something that should be a little bit more on their radar screen than it has been in the past. Yeah, and so how do you regulate that, though, you know? It's... It's, it's very hard. It's very hard because right now, even in 24 hours, there's still not enough time for them to get done everything they want. Most coaches would work around the clock if they, had, yeah. if they didn't, need, they didn't sleep. need sleep. That's yeah. right. They sure would. All right. So earlier today, 49ers owner Jed York uh, let go of head coach Chip Kelly, Trent Bulky, the GM there. And then he had a really interesting exchange with the 49ers beat reporters. Take a listen. Jed, you dismissed your general manager and coach because they didn't reach certain uh, performance standards. That's part of it. Okay, let's stick to that part. Why shouldn't you be dismissed or reassigned for the same reasons? Look, again, like nothing I'm going to say is going to be satisfactory. Say something. Well, nothing I'm going to say is going to be satisfactory. And again, we're going to be judged on what we do and what we accomplish. We haven't accomplished enough. I own this football team. You don't dismiss owners. I, I'm sorry that that's the facts and that's the case, but that's the fact. And I'm going to do everything that I can to get this right. This isn't about a business and running an operation to make money. We're making sure that we're doing everything that we can to reestablish this culture. It's not an easy decision to dismiss a head coach and a general manager, especially people that have, you know, a lot of time left on their deals. But I think that's the best thing for us. And that's what we need to do in order to get us back to where we want to be. All right, guys, I want to get your reaction to that. Adam, you first. Well, that's an aggressive form of questioning. It sounds like he's in New York. And, look, it, it's hard. I don't know it, that it's the press's job to demand yeah. answers like that. He, he's up there explaining himself as well as he can. It is not an easy position. The organization has floundered. He's responsible for it. He's had, he has to address that. He's doing as well as he can answering that. And the truth of the matter is there's nothing that he's going to say, nothing that he's going to say that's going to make much of a difference anyway. It's what he can go out and do, who he can go hire. 
There's nothing he's going to say at a press conference is going to make a difference. It's going to be in the results and in the production and in the performance, and we're not going to have that for weeks and months. Yeah, I, I think sometimes the press feels as though they are representing the public, and they wind up walking up to the line of inappropriateness and then crossing over it. And that may have been the case right there, without yeah. a doubt. I mean, obviously, I think Jed York understands what kind of situation he finds himself in. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been the only football team thus far to basically flatten his entire organization and go, guess what? This is all messed up. I got to start from ground zero. No one else is doing it. Everyone else is kind of picking pieces of well, going, well, maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's your fault. We need to re maybe replace a couple different parts. He understands, look, if you hire and fire two coaches, two different coaches in two consecutive years, you know you're doing something wrong. I think he understands that. Let's just see what he does now going forward over the next month. That makes you understand why, you, why some owners don't like to go up there in those press conferences. You know, Washington, Dan Snyder avoids it completely because maybe they want to avoid situations like that where – Perhaps maybe they feel like they're going to get attacked. Sure. Um, so that was a little awkward. It was also awkward in Buffalo today. GM Doug Whaley uh, was asked about the firing of Rex Ryan. Let's take a listen. We just finished our weekly phone conversation with, with Terry, myself, and Rex. Uh, Rex asked to speak to him privately. After that, I was informed uh, that Rex would no longer be our coach. I wasn't privy to the conversation, so I cannot get into those details. Why do you think that they didn't have faith in you to make that hire yourself? You're the general manager. That's one of the jobs that the general manager does. And what gives you any more credibility now? Well, back then, we'd have to talk to the Pagulas, but we decided as a group that we would make it a committee approach, and they would have the final say. And this time, um, I have faith. The ownership has faith in me, um, and I have faith in myself. And we'll see where it goes. But, and I understand the gravity of the situation. And I understand that it's falling square on my shoulders. And I accept the challenge. Lucy, you buying what he's saying there? Well, look, I mean, obviously you find it a little bit hard to believe that he wasn't consulted at all as far as what they thought the course should be going forward with Rex Ryan mm -hmm. prior to them having their private meeting. I mean, he did meet with the guy every day. He did work with him very closely. I think he would have some insight that even they did not have. Now, as far as him being entrusted with directing the franchise going forward and not really having the quote-unquote credentials or cred to go ahead and do that, well, hey, look, the Pagoulas own the football team. They can decide whoever they want to lead the franchise going forward. And what Doug will be judged on now, given what he just laid out, is the fact that, look, now it's your show. So I think you have to give him the benefit of the doubt strictly because of that. But as far as him not knowing anything about maybe where this was headed, of course you find that hard to believe because he has to be in constant contact with Rex and he has to be in constant contact with ownership to let them know how the team is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And there were reports that Rex was going to be it after the season, too. Right. So it's not like he was totally caught off guard. Sure. Like, oh, wow, our coach is gone. I mean, no, I don't think it happens. Yes. Anyway. All right. So in addition to the Broncos, Niners, Bills, Jags, Chargers, and Rams, they've all got to start over. Mm -hmm. So, Lewis, from, from your perspective, who's got the biggest challenge ahead of them? Uh, without a doubt, I think San Francisco does because of all the things that they need at some very, very critical positions, and they are really starting over from scratch. Mm -hmm. And so right now, Jed York is entrusted with finding two people who share his vision as well, because look, as ownership, he has to have a vision for what he thinks the San Francisco 49ers should look like going forward. So he has to find people who kind of share some commonalities with him and then find two people who share commonalities with one another. The roster needs a complete overhaul at some, at some very, very critical positions. They need some very, they need much better players. So it's going to be a longer process, I believe, for them. I think he will need to be patient. He already said he will be patient, and he will give whoever is given that position the support and the time to go ahead and get that done. So I think in that way, when you kind of come full circle with it, yeah. it winds up becoming a very attractive situation as long as he makes good on everything that he said he would. Did you take the job? <laughs> Sure, I would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> look at the new GM right here. Well, well you're singing the praise of it. I get, I hear no, what you're I saying. Mean, it's because, they look, have that mountain to look, climb. But look, there, there's not a whole lot of impediments to success there, provided that he makes good on everything that he says. And why wouldn't you take him at his word? I think you see a guy who understands that, look, I've gotten some things wrong. I mean, really, what else do you want him to say? Do you want him to, like, tear his shirt open oh, yeah. and say, hey, no, no. what do you want to do? You want to mark me? I mean, what do you want to do? I think he is kind of laying it out there, again, to be judged in the future if he doesn't do what he said he's going to do. So what more do you want? Adam, what are they, who are they looking at? Do you know of any names right now that are floating around for, for GM or for head coach? Right now, the San Francisco 49ers yeah, gonna... have put in for Nick Casario and Josh McDaniels. The name Chris Ballard was out there. He's not going to interview for that job. The Kansas City Chiefs, director of personnel, 
There's some other names that they'll look at. Wouldn't surprise me if they looked at a guy like Trent Kirshner in Seattle, who's done a nice job with the Seahawks. Uh, Elliot Wolfs in Green Bay. Chris Pollock. There's a lot of guys out yeah. there with connections. But, again, they want to make sure that those two guys are joined together, aligned, GM, hey, coach. They have not had that, and they believe that that's critical for the sex of this franchise moving forward. You think they'd hire one guy to do both? No. GM and coach, you think they're going no. to be separate hires? Separate hires, two guys that support each other, believe in each other, and want to work together. And do you have any other news for us on, on, on the other openings in the NFL today? Can you check your I phone think, for me? Look, this is the, <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing is it's the Monday after the season, mm -hmm. and it's the only Monday that I could ever remember where there has not been really a single head coaching move made after the regular season ends. Yeah. And that's because we had six at the close of the regular season last night. I don't think it's done just yet. I think there will be more. The question is when, how. We're waiting to see what happens in Indianapolis. The people in the building there said today, status quo, business as usual. But it's not business as usual until we hear from the owner and he determines and says, I'm keeping everything the same or I'm making changes. Yeah, guys, really good job. Good stuff. And you get dessert for not being on your phones during this entire segment. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. You got it. Still to come, it's a week three rematch between the Packers and Giants. Here with Giants head coach Ben McAdoo has to say about this weekend's wild card matchup. We'll have that.